Our, uh, our next speaker is Kent Duffy of SRG Partnerships. And Kent is going to speak to us uh, about the very important issue of translating lots of great microbial research to the architecture community. Uh, so, uh, I'm an architect, and the first thing I thought of when I got invited to speak here was that it was a mistake. And then I realized I'm here to tell you a story that changed the culture of our firm, the way we approach design, and the characteristics of the projects we create. And um, I think the first thing to say is that we value working with researchers. And that's evidenced by the fact that we've been working with the Energy Studies and Buildings Laboratory from the University of Oregon for 18 years, actually over 18 years and over 100 projects. And that led us to uh, the fact that they became involved in the BioB project at the University of Oregon. And uh, so we got to meet Jessica Green. And now we're working with a group called the uh, Tall Building Design Institute, um, uh, which is a collaboration of the University of Oregon College of Design and the Colleges of Engineering and uh, Forestry from Oregon State University, which is a great story in itself because those are two schools that think of themselves as being in competition, but now they're collaborating and doing things that are really worthwhile. So um, for us, and I hope I'm going to push the right button here, it worked. Um, it started on a project for the University of Oregon the Business School, the Lillis Business Complex. And uh, it's a building that's full of daylight. It's full of natural ventilation. It's got some lecture halls with uh, those aren't lights up above those students. Those are skylights with operable louvers. Uh, and they, one of the cornerstones of this project was the, the case study rooms for the business school. And uh, the, well, the big thing we learned as we went through the exercise at the beginning of the design process was that we could expand the comfort range of the people in the room by five degrees by a combination of thermal mass and ceiling fans. And uh, that may not sound like a lot, but you're going to see in a moment that it has a big impact. The second thing we realized was that to make that system really energy efficient, we should do what we call a night flush cycle. And so air would come in, um, which button do I push here for laser? Okay, so put, air comes in here, goes under the floor, comes up by the people, comes up, goes into the hallway and down the hallway and goes through a four-story atrium, all by stack effect to, uh, to cool the building. The, um, that strategy was huge. It actually meant that we could actually passively cool this building. Now, the university was really cautious, and they said, we want a mechanical cooling system anyway. And we did that. The, um, this chart shows you, on the left, I mean, the vertical axis is degrees in Fahrenheit. Across the top are hours, the 24 hours of the day. And in each little square you see here, that's how many times in the calendar year it's that temperature at that time of day. The uh, people normally think they're comfortable to about 78 degrees. Uh, we've expanded it to uh, 83 degrees with our five degrees. Uh, and nobody believes us when we do that, but when we actually build a building and then go try it out, they think it's great. The punchline for this is that this building in these case study rooms with 60 people in them all day long required cooling for four hours in the entire calendar year, all of them after 5 o'clock. For us, that was a breakthrough to find out that we could make a building more energy efficient and more comfortable at the same time. It really just ignited our imaginations about what can we do next. Well, um, the next project that came along was for a monastery, a, a seminary building at a monastery, Mount Angel Abbey. And, uh, we told that story to the monks and they said, great, so give us a building that doesn't use any uh, electric, uh, electric lights unless it's dark outside, and give us a building that has no active cooling system. 
and we set about that. This classroom model was the core uh, idea in the project that everything revolved around. And what you see is that uh, daylight comes in through a skylight with active operable louvers that open and close based on what, uh, how much sun there is and how many people are in the room. Uh, that light comes and bounces off a reflector, off a, a sloping ceiling, and distributes extraordinarily evenly throughout the entire room. And the, uh, the other thing that's going on here is that we have high and low ports for air to come across and flow by thermal mass in the floor and thermal mass in the roof. And all this is going on with stack effect. No fans involved. It's just open the dampers and let it flow. The uh, classroom looks like this. And, uh, and I want to point out there are no lights on in this photograph. Uh, it's all just the light from the skylight being evenly distributed and no glare from the skylight at the same time. Um, and this uh, close-up of the reflector, the top surface up here is what's doing all the heavy lifting in terms of distributing the light. We, tr we did a build a full-size mock-up and we tested it with multiple versions of how to create the reflector. And every other version, round, square, rectangular, all looked like a dark cloud in the center of the room. Not until we gave them a, a knife edge at the bottom and grazing light on both sides did we end up with a glowing surface above so nobody comes in the room and thinks they need to turn on the lights. The, um, uh, so while we were busy doing that, the Energy Studies in the Buildings Lab became part of the BioB project uh, with Jessica Green and her group. And uh, they tested. 300 locations throughout the business school, swabbing it to see what the microbial environment was indeed. And they found out that, in fact, based on whether it was naturally ventilated or mechanically ventilated, and they controlled that for this example, because the rooms could both be operated uh, naturally ventilated, they found it made a big difference in terms of the microbial environment. Uh, and they, uh, they also found that the uh, similar rooms ended up with similar microbial environments. They found out that if, in fact, rooms were near each other, they were connected. And this is actually a map of how many doors apart these spaces are. And they also found out that spaces near each other are more similar than things that are farther apart, just based on the microbial community spreading uh, between spaces. What I didn't tell you about before was at the, at the business school, um, when we came to the faculty offices, they basically split down the middle. And 50% of them said, we have to have an air-conditioned office. And the other 50% said, we have to have a naturally ventilated office. And as it turned out, we, made, we gave them what they asked for. So on opposite sides of a corridor, we have naturally ventilated rooms, and we have mechanically ventilated rooms. And it, it, uh, it actually, we were having a lot of trouble making it work on the south side. We, were try we set out to make it all work that way, but we, there was enough heat coming through the walls and everything that we just couldn't quite pull it off. But inadvertently, we gave the BioB project a, a great test case. Uh, and so, uh, so here you see the diagram, oops, sorry. Go back, how do I go back? No, I can't go back? Oh, I see, the red area, okay. I'm trying, give me a break, okay. So, uh, so here you are, the air is supplied through a mechanical system and taken away by a mechanical system. Here the air is flowing in from the outside through a, a, a vent below the window, and you can also open the window, uh, and then take it away. In both cases, the air from these rooms goes down the hall to that uh, four-story atrium and is used to condition that space before it exhausts the building. The punchline in this is that when you look at this, this is um, more similar to human microbes, uh, and this is more similar to what you find in soil and water. And what you see, the blue uh, oval has to do, is identifying the microbial community in the offices that are naturally ventilated. And the red one is identifying the ones in the um, mechanically ventilated and air-conditioned offices. I think there's two things about that. One, they really identify different parts of the diagram. And second, 
the one from the naturally ventilated area is a bigger oval than the one from the uh, mechanically ventilated, and it indicates uh, the diversity of, of that community. Um, so we got really interested in, in that question, and we actually found ourselves wondering what is the impact on human health? Uh, we don't know the answer. I'm hearing a lot of different variations on the possibilities as we listen. I, what I really understand is we need a lot more research to figure it out. Uh, we started the next project is actually for the uh, Knight Cancer Research Lab, or OHSU, and um, they are in the business of trying to cure cancer. They had a great number of concerns about the um, toxins in the building materials the building was being constructed of. And they basically said to us, don't, you know, we're in the business of curing cancer, don't give us a building that's going to give us cancer. Uh, great idea, uh, but this is pretty new territory. Uh, what we did do was develop an approach to that. Um, so we avoided what are called red list ingredients, uh, we avoided carcinogenic ingredients, and we also uh, are com complying with the, what's called LEED version 4 uh, materials criteria. Uh, and then on top of that, we said, look for the things that there's the most of in the building, look for the things that are the highest contact with people, and look for the things that are known to pose health hazards. Uh, we went through a process of looking at various um, criteria that different, have been identified in different ways of uh, uh, understanding the properties of materials. We tried to sort through them. We went through a process of, of ranking them, and the, in this case, the, well, in any case, the darkest color of green in our chart was the material that had the least toxins involved uh, to be included in the project. We were also trying to make places that people wanted to occupy. And in fact, making places that people would be drawn to and, and whether or not they understood the properties of uh, how many toxins were in it, uh, what, uh, that they would want to be there and engage in a dialogue and help find the answers to what causes cancer. I'm gonna show you one more example because there's a big resurgence right now in the interest in um, what we call mass timber buildings. And, um, and this is a project we're working on right now. It's a 200,000 square foot parking structure, an open air structure, um, built with, uh, with a wood structure. And uh, everybody was really worried about the wood decaying. We turned to our researcher friends and we asked them, well, what causes decay? And they said, microbes, fungi, and insects. Well, two out of three uh, are things we've been talking about a lot in this room uh, for the last few days. And so, uh, and they also said, you know, the biggest thing you need to worry about is it not getting wet. So, um, first thing we did was go to the Energy Studies and Buildings Lab and they told us, and I didn't know this information was available in the world, when it rains, which way the wind's blowing, and how hard. And that helped us develop a strategy of creating a perimeter walkway around this building. And it's actually, a, it's a, both a design feature for the people occupying the building. 70% of the people parking the structure are at the perimeter. They can step out of their cars and not walk in the drive aisle. They can walk forward into a walkway around the entire perimeter of the building that also is the sheltering system for keeping the wood dry. Now the bottom half of these columns was a concern and in fact, uh, we went through a, a research process on trying out materials, and uh, it's hard to see, but there's an element here. We originally thought that was going to be glass, to, the, and putting it in the positions where the wind-driven rain wouldn't get to the columns. It turns out there's a stainless steel wire fabric that does an amazing job of ha in intercepting the uh, wind-driven rain and channeling down vertically through it and dumping it out at the bottom so it never really gets to the, to the wood. Uh, it's, uh, and this is, by the way, a building that has a lot of uh, interesting um, uses of what's called cross-laminated timber. One of them is a, is a, uh, uh, a rocking shear wall that's post-tensioned. 
And it's actually a set of uh, CLT panels that rock back and forth in an earthquake. They have a spring connection between them. And when it's, it's um, uh, post-tension so that when it's all done having an earthquake, it comes back to the original position. It was just tested at the University of California in San Diego in July. It went through two Northridge earthquakes sequential and ended up with no damage. So um, uh, that just shows the exterior of the building. Uh, uh, well, we're, anyway, it's actually going to be net positive for both water and net positive for energy on top of being a carbon sequestering structure. So um, if you think about the design process as a decision-making <coughs> process, what people bring to it in terms of their experience and their attitude makes a big difference. As architects, we're trained uh, to think of structure as framing the space. Now, after we've worked with the Energy Studies and Buildings Lab, we realize that comfort is the framer of people's experience in that space. And so we pay a lot of attention to that. And then, frankly, what we're starting to think about now is what makes people healthy in those spaces. So it takes a lot of people working hard together to pull that off. And I think one of the most important lessons we learned when we started working with the Energy Studies and Buildings Lab 18 years ago, um, we could hardly find a mechanical engineer prepared to design a passive system. But now, after we've been through this process, we have engineers who are enthusiastic about it. We have contractors who are enthusiastic about uh, building the buildings. We have some contractors supplying systems that support it. We have workers in the field that use a new, higher level of standard of care in the field to build those buildings. And we have owners now that expect us to perform at that level and demand it from the start. That's a big transition that has happened in the course of our work with the Energy Studies and Buildings Lab. And frankly, we think that the, the threshold is there for us to have a comparable level of impact as we think about how to handle the microbial uh, world in our buildings. The key for us is we need you to keep doing your research. And we need to be in touch with you so that we can both use the knowledge you're creating and we can ask you questions that prompts future research. And I have to say that basically why I'm here today is to ask you to engage the design community in your research because we're the ones making the decisions that end up in the buildings that you're studying. And if we're going to shape a future that's better off, we need to work together. saying that yeah, this talk gave me great joy. Um, seeing an architect that I haven't collaborated with directly describe a microbiome ordination diagram, um, you, you crushed it, and I, that's fantastic. Um, you know, I just really love your insight into um, how designers and this group can move forward together, because you've heard the great cautionary tales that are coming from the scientific community that are well, very well founded. Um, but as you know, you're designing buildings all of the time. So when I kind of close my eyes and picture what's happening, it's, um, I feel like the scientists were on the platform of the train. The trains are going. And so it could take a very long time to reach consensus um, to kind of provide guidance to the designers. So what do you think is the right thing to do? Um, uh, not being all um, knowing, um, let me say first of all that I think, uh, first of all, yesterday there was a, co a question about, you know, can we impact the microbial environment and should we? And I guess in my heart, my answer is we already are. 
we're just finding out what the impact is. And, and we need to know a lot more before we can uh, probably act appropriately. My sense is that it really uh, it needs to be an incremental approach. Need, you know, we need to study the buildings we've got. We need to try things out and need to keep tinkering. Oops, sorry. Um, I just, uh, I'm just struck. I mean, you, you're right. I, as I've listened here, I've heard a range of things that really tell me that how much we don't know. And I, uh, I guess I just feel like the whole idea of exploring and exploring in more detail and communicating with each other. You're right, we're, every day we're designing buildings and, we're, and we do it with relish. We, we love to create places that people are drawn to and want to spend time in. Uh, and we want to make places that are healthy for them. Um, uh, but we're not researchers. Uh, we don't know a way around the, our lab, and we really need you guys to help us get there. To follow up on that, oh, I'm John Spear from the Colorado School of Mines. I want to thank you for calling out my colleague Ling Pei on the mm -hmm. shape table, UCSD. Yep. Um, I think a lot of interesting things happen at interfaces, and you just described that, where you're thinking about microbiome and architecture. How do we get more architects thinking about microbiology and biology? Um, you know, I, I think, uh, I mean, I, what I said earlier, you know, I, I was trained to think about structure, and now I, because I've worked with people who, who are deeply concerned about comfort, I have a whole other understanding. I think we just need to expose each other to it. I think, uh, I think making a presentation about this at the AIA National Conference or at regional conferences so that architects and edu architectural educators become aware of this would be really important. Um, and I, I think it just, it's the beginning of a conversation that just needs to happen. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any resistance. I just see people just aren't aware of it. Uh, is there, so it looks like there's one more, or oh, two, I guess two more? No, I think we need to move on. Okay, so, so I'm done. Short, uh, so I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you later. Thank you.